put a, two other individuals similar, similar to Osama bin Laden that you studied very closely as director of the CIA. Tell me about these two individuals what, that also were in Pakistan, are, were in and are in Pakistan. Firstly, Muller Omar. How did Muller Omar, how did he make it from the tribal region to all the way to Karachi? He was recently, it was announced that he died in a Karachi hospital, not up in the tribal region or anything. Firstly, him. And then secondly, Zakawi, with all of our intelligence apparatus, why haven't we gotten this anti-Semitic, Egypt, anti-American, Egyptian doctor? Zawari, you're talking uh, about. Uh, Zawari, I mean. Right. No, Alman, no. Alman Zawari. Yeah. Alman Zawari, right? Egyptian, right? Correct. And he was sort of the, the cultural uh, sanity behind the oh. Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda movement, if, so to speak. Um, he has uh, hidden himself very well, and I, I have to be very careful of, uh, about this because we were getting into operations and methods, and these people are uh, still active. So I'm going to be very circumspect. I'll just simply tell you that any number of times as we developed our operational capabilities, I truly thought we were going to get Swari. I, I felt we had it. Is, is, he just a lu is he just lucky? Like, is his time running out that a cat has nine lives? I think, he's, I, I think w there are enough close calls that he has really uh, protected himself. Let's or, put it that or way. Or he's ticked off by ISI. I... Sure, ISI, uh, Pakistani intelligence, they uh, play both sides. Uh, you know, uh, the biggest issue in Pakistan, believe it or not, is not the Americans. It's it's uh, Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And uh, that gets the Pakistanis going quicker than anything. And uh, the Indians and the Pakistanis are still talking about that plebiscite uh, that hasn't quite been resolved yet. And, uh, you know, the British got out of town before they fixed it. And... Uh, Pakistan's a nuclear power, India's a nuclear power, and they get really agitated with each other rather regularly. It, it was at one point, uh, it ha has been in more than one time, uh, actually, I thought the biggest uh, potential nuclear hazard the world faced was uh, pulling the trigger between Pakistan and India over Kashmir. Now, the Pak intelligence people use the Taliban on their east border with the Indians. There's no question about it. They work together. On the west border, things are not the same with the Afghani. And there's some feeling there. You go back into the history, you'll find there's some families involved. Everything's very tribal. Uh, and some people, uh, leaders of one family, end up killing leaders of another family. And people don't get over that stuff and then quickly over there. So uh, in this case, they're on opposite sides of the border. And so the Taliban have a somewhat different role in the... Uh, federally administered tribal areas, the Fatah and the Hindu Kush, are just basically down the border and Khyber Pass, that area of the Torah Bar. Um, and, and so you're dealing with very different peoples, uh, valley to valley to valley, uh, the different tribe, and you have to make a different deal in a different place. Ma Omar managed to pull some of those people together, and uh, he successfully created a force that could get back and forth on either side of the border, had it, the people in play, had enough family relations around, so that he has survived very well, uh, it, it, not, not entirely uh, without, uh, without scar tissue. Uh, he, was a, he was a fighter, and he was well-respected, and he built up through the ranks. Um, and that happens occasionally with some of them. Frankly, uh, we've gotten sophisticated enough we're getting good enough, we have enough operational capability now, that there aren't many of those success stories building now because we seem to be able to get the, the guy in charge of operations a, a lot quicker than we used to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in fact, that we got good enough at it, it was sort of, the question was, well, who is in charge today? Because they weren't going to be in charge tomorrow. Uh, because we'll get them today. And we put together our Title 10 and Title 50 capabilities in Iraq and learned so much doing that. The great people we have in the military and our intelligence capacity and our intelligence people, both overseas and at home, the, the analytical side, uh, it, there's not a force like it in the world. It's, it's just simply unbelievable. We have the ability uh, to do these things. What we do not have is the policy to do these things. We don't put these assets out there 
to take the action that we could take to deal with some of these problems. And if you think, well, what is the consequence if you don't do that? No boots on the ground, no combat aircraft involved. What happens? Well, you announce that you're going to have regime change in a place like Syria, and that there are red lines and so forth, and then there's no regime change and there's no red line enforcement, and what happens? It, it goes to hell in a, in a handbasket very quickly. Libya, what happened in Libya? Well, oh gosh, we, we'll just stand on the edges. We'll tiptoe around and send in some other forces. Didn't work. Look at what's going on in Libya today. More franchises, more, more uh, problems going on. The country's a mess, and it's going to be very hard to recover. So, so applying these capacities, these capabilities that we have, is a policy issue. And we have the men and women, we have the capability, but we do not have the leadership that wants to use policies to take advantage of these advantages that we have. Uh, it is very frustrating for people like me. And I imagine if uh, Mike Hayden or George Tennant or uh, any of the wartime directors were here, they'll tell you the same thing. Why in God's name is this happening? Is this being allowed to happen? It's not new. This started in the late 70s. We discovered terror in the late 70s. We took some heavy losses over in Lebanon and that part of the world. We learned about terror. It's not a brand new thing. And you would think after 9-11, the American people would totally understand that we need to be committed to deal with this because it's not going away unless we do. But we are still debating whether we will deal with it. Go figure. And just tell me, Muller Omar. We oh, use, sorry. We, we don't know his perfect answer. <laughs> no, the one I guy. What, no, 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 what no, is no, it about Mullah Omar? I, I, like? I, I just find it's fascinating. How were you surprised that he died in a Karachi hospital and not up in? And how does he how does he get from the Northern Territory all the way down to Karachi? You know, one day it's not hard. One day yeah, he took a bus, probably. No, but, um, but look, look, look. I, look, I mean look. it. He probably took a bus. <laughs> um, I uh, one day. Um, I was briefing the president uh, on something, and he said, well, why haven't you caught him? I, I said, Mr. President, I promise you, if I were sitting on a bus next to this guy, he might be so well disguised that I would not know him. And he looked at me, and he said, no. And I said, yes. <laughs> and I don't know to this day whether he thought I was crazy or not. But it's true. These guys are masters of moving around. They're very good. Sometimes they dress like women. You know, they don't dress like women. They put on women's apparel. Excuse me. Got to be bright, precise about that. Um, and so there, there's a million ways they do things. Plus, in the tribal areas, nothing happens. Nothing transpires in that zone uh, that those people don't know about mm -hmm. and don't allow. So you have to make your, your deal. Uh, and Mullah Omar has been around a long time, part of a big tribal group, the Haqqanis. Uh, there's several involved with this. Uh, but he, he, got his, uh, he got enough of a base before the heat came so that it sustained him, I guess is the way I put it. He got big enough, quick enough, so that some of the things we're able to do now, he was able to avoid. And that's what's true with Zawari, Zawari today. Uh, I think that, um, I, boy, would I love to get that guy and talk to him. Yeah, I, I really would. That what would be. A, what, what, what would be the first question that you? First couple of questions you would have your interrogators ask him. Well, always the first question is, uh, you know, what's happening next? Uh, you know, force prote force protection things, but not only the targets. What's in, what's action? What do we need to look out for? How are we doing? You know, well, following what, the money, following the propaganda. They've gotten so good at propaganda, exploiting our freedoms in this country. You know, most of the country, most of the world. Mm -hmm. is run by authoritarian people. There, there are very few places, even in democracies, that it, it, there's not a degree of authoritarianism that we don't understand in this country. We have a very unique democracy. We have freedom and openness, transparency, all this, well, most of the time we do, and people expect that in our country. So we have a free, democratic, open society. The audience I'm talking to here today isn't a private group of people coming in. It's actually the whole globe because everything now is global. So I know that everything I say in this room could just as easily show up on TV in Hong Kong tomorrow or 
uh, in a cave uh, you know, on the Hindu Kush in three days from now. So you, you've got to sort of take that into effect. Well, these guys have figured this out, and they exploit our free, democratic, open society, and they use something called propaganda. Now, do they have an advantage at this? You think not. Well, of course they've got an advantage. We have a law that says we cannot do any propaganda, even CIA, the unique organization that can do stuff overseas, if the message is going to come back and contaminate the American public opinion. Well, what is it? coming back these days. Well, everything is global. So that sort of puts us out of the propaganda business and CIA say, we can't plant a story that is liable to come back and be picked up by the New York Times as gospel that Americans will believe is true. That's, that's inappropriate for us to be doing in a free democratic open society, believing the truth. Well, it doesn't stop them. They'll put anything out there, and if they get the New York Times to bite, they'll bite. Um, so, I mean, they have found so many ways to take advantage of things. You think some of this stuff going on on airplanes where, you know, you, people are coming on dress funny and so forth is, is just, uh, just for somebody's amusement? No, they're really testing the system. Uh, and, you know, you talk to, I don't know, do you get the FBI in here often? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you talk to the guys who have to deal with it on the domestic side, they've got a huge problem because they've got a due process problem. Uh, they've got privacy rights and all this other stuff. We don't have quite that much problem overseas because we're not usually dealing with, uh, CIA is not dealing with American citizens by and large. So what we're, what we're dealing with is guys, we give them leave to break uh, the law of the foreign land, not our laws, but the law of the foreign land. That means they can do certain things, but not, not here. So actually our law enforcement people with the loaders and the homegrown folks now have got a much bigger problem and that's why the threat is so much bigger. That's why I see guys like Call Me and so forth going out there and say, this is serious. And see Jim Clapper, who's the director of national intelligence thinking, what is Jim Clapper doing talking about domestic law enforcement as a director of national intelligence? He's supposed to be doing intelligence. We don't do intelligence on ourselves in this country. But, We've gotten all sort of wrapped around the axle on that. And it's, uh, they figured out, the radical extremists have figured out how to, uh, how to use our own stuff against us. And they do it very, very brilliantly. Be besides future questions, future attacks, money trail, how it operates, what has puzzled you that you would like, you would ask Zuari from the past that's puzzled you over time that you would like to learn that you think would be helpful to the intelligence community? Well, I, I will if, tell you, if, if going out with the interrogation after we've done the, the normal uh, is something about to blow up, uh, you know, those kinds of things, uh, and force protection questions for our people, our operation procedures and stuff, then then you quickly, you get into sort of the, uh, so let's go back and examine how exactly did this come to pass that you were able to do this? Uh, you get into those kinds of questions, and the ones I would personally have would be, Excuse me. Were you at such and such a place on such and such a day? Mm -hmm. uh, and and I would like to know why I might have thought so and he didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that they would be those kinds of questions. They would not add a lot probably to the the corpus of uh, uh, important intelligence. But I'm, you know, how did they get that wrong? Would be, but it would it would with operational detail with Al Qaeda and other stuff, understanding their movements and how they are tricking sometimes CIA and other intelligence organizations. Uh, they were very, they're very good at diversionary things. They're, I mean, they have really, they are so much better at unconventional warfare than we are because we're, we're hung up with military protocols under our, our, all of our Title X stuff, and we're uh, hung up under due process uh, in this country uh, under Title 50. So uh, we've got laws making sure we are uh, obeying the Marcus of Queensberry rules, the Geneva Convention, the protocol. You think the radical terrorists, they'd behead the Marcus of Queensberry if they could get him, and they'd blow up the Geneva Accords in a nanosecond.